Good afternoon, everybody. It's the 8th of June. You're here at Lunch and Learn. Uh, today, as you know, is part two of the talk being done by myself and uh, Dr. Leslie Sherlin. Uh, we're talking about specifically ethics in regards to scope of practice. So this is part two. Part one has been posted on the New Mind Technologies um, you know, YouTube channel if you want to review it. Um, Leslie, are you okay if we, uh, can we send these slides out to people in a PDF format yeah. when we're done? Yeah, okay, totally. so Leslie totally. will shoot those to me and I'll post them on a listserv for everybody. So uh, we'll start with you, Leslie. We started last week and uh, got going and here we are in equipment, so we'll let you begin. Yeah, so I think um, <clears throat> as far as equipment goes for us, one of the things that we want to have in mind is to what uh, application are we applying our equipment? And so, um, you know, this, particular slide is really aimed at vendors or individuals who are selling FDA or re re registered equipment. It's important that uh, they are doing so to licensed providers. There is a, um, well, let me rephrase, depending on the type of registration the equipment has may dictate the type of licensing required for the individual or the customer in this case, to be uh, in order for them to be able to purchase the equipment. So that gets dictated based on the type of equipment. <laughs> Generally speaking, when it's FDA registered equipment for the use of medical or other types of um, applications that are in the medical realm, and, and neurofeedback would be that if it were a, had a, a 510K clearance, which is a device that has um, been authorized for use in a medical domain, that would require selling to a licensed individual. However, some devices that are on the market and aimed at um, neurofeedback providers may be FDA registered, but that registration is not as a medical device, but instead something that's like a general biofeedback device, um, might be something that's registered to demonstrate safety, but is not limited and restricted uh, to the sale of a licensed provider. So the point of this, is the vendor is responsible for understanding and knowing to whom they might sell. But we as the provider or the particular, the customer of this vendor should also have some awareness around what is the registration of this device uh, and who is whom is it intended for, what application, what use case, and then either being in compliance with that or having an appropriate license that allows for off-label use in some way. So this can get really messy pretty quickly. Um, you know, fortunately, it's not one that, you know, most of the types of things that we're engaging in have generally low risk. It doesn't mean that they're completely harmless. We know that harm can come from mis misapplication of neurofeedback devices. However, it's generally low risk. It's not like we're doing laser surgery or something like this that's going to cause, um, you know, uh, irreversible you know, permanent uh, life-threatening kinds of um, situations, but important for us to be aware of what can we get and to whom should we apply it and so that we're not risking setting ourselves up for any risk or liability. Yeah, and, and I think a good examples of equipment that one might get a hold of that would not fit into that category of FDA register would be what used to be the Muse and now may be the Mind Lift. Um, I don't think that's a FDA type registered project <clears throat> product and, you know, people can buy those uh, separately on their own. Some of those things can be registered and then still be over the counter use. It's not restricted to uh, being sold to a licensed provider. So the onus, again, is, is should be on the vendor to whom they're making sure that they're selling to the appropriate people. So if they ask the vendor asks for your license or a copy of your license or something like that, um, it's not an insult. They're just making sure that they're selling to the correct individuals which makes right. this not always, uh, not always the case. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. As we move in, and, and feel free, Rob, just to jump in. I mean, this is, I yep. don't want to <laughs> be the slide reader necessarily, but when you yeah, think you start, I'll join in. <laughs> okay, that sounds good. One of the things that um, often happens in supervision is for us to really understand the difference between mentoring and supervision. Uh, supervision is typically a very formalized process where the supervisor is legally responsible for the clients that the, the provider is seeing. So this would be typical in the, uh, like as a student in a graduate program of mental health care or in some post-doctoral or post-master's level um, licensing requirements. Maybe even the person has 
um, a, a newer, a, not an independent license, so like an associate license to practice. They would have a legal uh, relationship with their supervisor. Mentoring, on the other hand, is what you do when you say, hey, I'm new at this thing and I'm already a licensed provider and I want to do neurofeedback as an example and I need to have a mentor. So both the BCIA certification board, the QDG certification board, other um, types of certifications often require you to have mentoring hours, which are supervised, but um, we see, I already used the term supervised, but it's not a legal responsibility. It's just overseeing and educating more of a mentoring relationship. So we have to make sure that those things are, um, you know, being appropriately applied. So if we're, for example, a, um, a licensed mental health care provider, and we are doing something that is outside the scope of licensed mental health care providers, let's say applying neurofeedback for a seizure disorder, then that would require um, a, a legal supervision type of arrangement with a, a medical provider who could oversee that neurofeedback, even if we're the domain expert in the neurofeedback. Um, a very practical example, um, once was working in a medical clinic where I was under the supervision, the legal supervision of a physician, even though I was the domain expert in neurofeedback and QEG. So I would apply neurofeedback treatment protocol to, for the clients in a session, but was he was, as the physician, was legally responsible for those individuals uh, and their care. Yeah, this is the kind of topic, if you were to go to Judy Crawford at BCI and say, Judy, do you ever have headaches with people who don't understand supervision from mentoring? If you ever want to see Judy pull her hair out, just throw that question at her. It's the biggest one that uh, that we hear from her when uh, Leslie and I are preparing our annual talks on ethics. Uh, mentoring is teaching. Mentoring is guiding. Mentoring is doing all kinds of educational things. It is not supervision in a clinical sense like, um, uh, you know, uh, Leslie just described. So now in some states, and there's 10 states now where if you're a licensed uh, professional counselor, an LPC or similar like I am a licensed clinical mental health counselor, there's 10 states that now have re reciprocity between those states. Now, whether you can treat somebody there, which you can in, in those other states, because there's a reciprocity is one thing, but as Leslie said, it may be that those states have different requirements for supervision. So typically that supervision, when you're looking at clinical supervision is between yourself and somebody who has a similar degree and background and is an approved supervisor for purposes of you gaining your licensure. Yep. All right. It's Let's just move on. We can unpack that for for yeah. days, but I think I think you get the idea. <clears throat> um, so with medical disorders, you know, we use seizure disorder a lot because there is so much evidence in the literature about the efficacy of neurofeedback uh, and seizure disorder. So it's an easy one for us to neglect or or neglect our responsibility and kind of get caught up in providing. But this is one of the most um, the, the, one of the biggest medical disorders in which can only be under the scope of a, a physician. Period, the end of story, even though the research says neurofeedback is good for it, even though um, you might be an expert in neurofeedback and QEG in the application of neurofeedback for seizure disorder, unless you have the appropriate licensing, it's just out of scope. And that's it's just that really that straightforward. Yeah. And again, when you're looking at these things, uh, as we've said, if you have someone who has a seizure disorder, again, using an example, and you're working with that patient and you're not a medical doctor or neurologist, if you have a doctor who has basically written a script, if you will, for neurofeedback and is given a letter to you as a clinician to please use neurofeedback to treat this patient's whatever disorder it is, because it could be like migraine headaches or something, uh, then you've got much better coverage. So as the quote says from Mark Trulinger, if you can't diagnose it, you can't treat it. And while we're on that topic, uh, again, for people who were um, looking at insurance uh, reimbursement, uh, Mark is our the ISNR representative. He works directly with the AMA and the CPT committee to uh, get neurofeedback, um, you know, CPT codes in play. We were hoping to have that done by this year, but the pandemic shut down all those face-to-face -face meetings uh, by the AMA. And so we're running a year or two behind, it'll be 2003 or two, uh, 2024 before 
we get those codes hopefully out to people to use. But if you can't diagnose it, you can't treat it. And if you do realize those codes, this was on a discussion both on our listserv recently that Mark posted, as well as on the ISNR listserv. There's three codes you can use. There are, no matter what state you're in, because one person was saying, well, states have different whatevers. Well, states have different whatevers in some regards, but when it comes to the insurance billing, if you're doing it, you use the codes that Mark has described. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, many individuals, this is very common per practice. Uh, in fact, I have in my office also another person who has uh, works and does carries out training and general feedback training. So we want to think about like who what we are using for our staffing and as our technicians. Lots of times, most of the time, um, avoiding dual relationships is a good idea. Whenever we can avoid a dual relationship, you're going to be better off than not. However, not all dual relationships are ethical dilemmas or illegal or anything like that. It's not a necessity. However, there are some situations in which they absolutely are. Uh, one of those is generally speaking, um, having <clears throat> excuse me, having a family member uh, work with clients in a technician role is a very risky type of um, a, a situation. And we know that this happens, um, you know, when particularly in smaller uh, communities or in areas where uh, family members or maybe you know, both uh, husband and, and partner are, uh, you know, med mental health care providers. There's some nuances in there, but the point of this is that you generally would not want to be mentoring or supervising uh, in that legal way an individual who is a family member. That would now be a dual relationship, which is prohibited. That would be an ethical and even a legal situation if you are technically legally supervising and or mentoring in a formalized way that would be a, an ethical consideration that we would want to avoid so you know have, working in a practice with your partner or your child or whatever that scenario is that may not be uh, too big of a deal if they're working the front desk or they're they're independently licensed themselves and you're not supervising them that's a different kind of a scenario so we we'll make sure and create enough context around that that we understand the concept of not supervising, um, not hiring, me hiring my daughter who's not a mental health care, mental health care provider to carry out neurofeedback sessions in my office would be a violation. That would be bad form <laughs> as well as illegal in my state. So we yeah. have to think about those things and what organ your organization as well as your state or your license will dictate those things. Go ahead, Rob. Sorry, I didn't cut you off. I was going to say, yeah, this, and this is an example of the one that um, uh, the case I was talking about in our opening. And in this particular case, the woman was um, the licensed clinician and her husband's role was um, office manager. That's how he signed emails, paperwork, et cetera. He also served as an EEG technician, so he was doing neurofeedback, but he was not licensed and working under allegedly her scope of practice. So what got the attention of the board was she had him sitting in an evaluation and the client felt uncomfortable having her husband in there, uh, who was the, basically, as they saw it, an office manager at the front desk and reported this person to their, their licensing board. So that's a yeah. good example of a family member. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay, so I want to think about a couple of things where, um, you know, there's this like clinician concerns one. This is Rob. Allen. Actually, Rob, if you want to um, jump in, you're welcome to. Um, this is uh, some of the pieces that you've kind of piece together, but mm -hmm. the, the idea here is that uh, there's a lot of gray areas, and, and this is true if you've listened to us talk about ethics at all. Ethics, unfortunately, are not black and white. It's most all the time in the shades of gray area, and the things that are typically kind of the concerns for us is the blending of are we treating the disorder that the individual has or are we treating the symptoms that are resultant from a given disorder or, or challenge? For example, uh, as listed here, a traumatic brain injury. So that's, that's a medical condition. However, there are a lot of mental health or psychological types of symptoms that are downstream from that that are resultant. And that would be, so the question is, are we applying neurofeedback? Let's say I'm and 
I'm utilizing neurofeedback. I have domain expertise and can confidently do that with the traumatic brain injury symptoms. But the traumatic brain injury is outside my scope of practice. This is the gray area. I'm downstream from the head injury. Maybe we're not directly doing that, but it's definitely perceivable. It could be argued, particularly in the court of law, that I'm actually treating symptoms that are a result of TBI. Therefore, I'm treating a TBI, which is out of scope. So there's a lot of nuances in here, and we want to make sure, uh, you know, in general, the the advice I think would be if you're in doubt, think about the risk assessment. It is how risky is this scenario. If it's arguably that, you know, this person's um, symptom is a direct, direct result of their TBI, it would be a very easy connection to argue in a court that I'm actually treating the TBI. Where if it's something that can exist or does exist on its own, maybe there is a traumatic brain injury that has occurred and now this person has downstream, they have some uh, depressed mood, maybe they have some other things that are you know, contributory, contributed to by the head injury, but are not a result of the head injury, then that, and you can argue that and document that, then I think that's a bit less risky. Uh, it doesn't mean that you won't be finding yourself being questioned, but it's at least a much lesser risk to you, uh, to us as a, as a provider. Exactly. On, on that topic, too, um, recently uh, there was a paper written, and I think I've shared that paper uh, on this listserv here, uh, that the ISNR group is looking into, looking at the broader picture of scope of practice and ethics and how we market and advertise ourselves. And I think what you were saying is so critical. You and I, Leslie, have been working with patients uh, or clients for years. I use the term patients because my training was at a medical university and I was trained as a rehab counselor. So I was trained to specifically work with medical disorders, typically people who had issues, mental health issues, had my leg amputated, had a stroke, had a heart attack, you know, post-cancer problems and all that stuff. So um, when you're looking at working with patients or clients, and you look at your, your scope of practice, you have to be careful about the terms you use. If we say treatment, and most of us use the word treatment because we're all mental health professionals and treating patients with mental health disorders, but in the world of neurofeedback, be careful. Don't use the term neurotherapist. Again, in the case I previously cited where this person got called to task, um, her husband, unlicensed, was calling himself a neurotherapist. That's a problem. So if you're using your terms that are more general, like instead of treatment, we're working with you know self-regulation skills, self-improvement skills, cognitive improvement, or if you're a mental health professional saying, you know, I'm working with anxiety or depression or things like that, that's within your scope. And those are typically, as we've all seen here, symptoms you can see in a brain map. You can see through asymmetry somebody who's got depression or anxiety, and we cover that all the time. So be careful with the words you use, not only in terms of in front of your patients and to con and consults, but this got picked up, this paper that was written was people who went over websites of people who were neurofeedback clinicians. So all they had to do was go to ISNR, look at people who were clinicians or BCIA and look at people who were registered clinicians that are BCI certified, go to their websites and they went and did all this and found all these terms that people use that they found is really problematic. And that's can create more of that sort of problematic gray area. Yeah, and the reason, you know, it's uh, for us, uh, like I can certainly, it is. it can be frustrating to think about like, uh, to, you know, because we know that it's just a matter of semantics in some of these cases, whether you call it treatment or training, the process is the same. Whether you call it, I'm um, helping you self-regulate or we're doing you know, something else that, um, you know, or if we're saying uh, we're working on focus versus an attention disorder. We know that the processes are the same, and that can be very frustrating to us. But the reason why it's such a big deal is the perception of the public. The scope of practice mm -hmm. challenge is not for us, the provider, but to make sure that the public, the layperson, your client or patient, are understanding the actual intention of what it is you're doing. So before being a licensed provider, when I was working predominantly and solely in sport and performance, I would never use the word treatment, always use the word training. You and I both know that process is exactly the same. But the client, the customer, the person who is receiving that feedback, they 
needed to understand the limitations. And if I said I was providing them with training, that's a very different thing than treatment. So, and if I said we're working on your focus, rather than saying we're treating an attention disorder or something, even whether the attention disorder was present or not, that wasn't part of the scope of our evaluation or any of those things. It was just about enhancing focus in order to do a particular task in the sport world. Semantics were, were aimed, the reason why the semantics were so important was simply so that that person that, that who was receiving the intervention knew the limitations of what uh, what we were doing and what their expectations about that was. So yes, it's semantics and that can be frustrating for us because it's the same thing many times, not always, but many times it's the same process, uh, but it is important for the, for the full disclosure and the, the awareness of the client. All right. All right. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So another, this is another one from, um, <laughs> from Judy pulling her hair out yet again. Uh, folks, uh, when you're when you're looking to become, uh, you know, board certified by BCIA, um, until you officially get that piece of paper in hand that says you are a board certified, you know, neurofeedback practitioner or biofeedback practitioner, it's not. Don't don't put you know almost a BCIA or almost board certified or working on. But just don't put any initials behind your other credentials until you have that certification done. Um, uh, again, somebody don't, uh, this makes up, you know, board certified B candidate. Um, there are people out there who have um, owners of companies and they do their own training. And through their training, they will um, say, okay, you're now certified in the use of um, I'll just make something up. You're now using in, in brain training, uh, um, machine, you know, neurofeedback, just making up a name like brain training, you know, equipment. So, um, you know, you, you, they'll, they'll say that you're certified to use their equipment um, or you're, you're certified in, in the use of their um, software or something like that. But that's different than being board certified by BCIA. So if you don't have the credential, point being, don't put it behind your name until you get it. Yeah, and you know, I caution, I have a tons of certifications. And so like people make fun of me for having, in fact, my wife's boss calls me alphabet soup or something because of you know having credentials that follow the name. So I can certainly appreciate that there is this notion that that gives the public um, increased confidence in your skill set or whatever it is, but it only takes a minute and a half to, for them to look up what these things mean and realize, you know, either we have a certification or that it's from a lesser type of a situation where it's like, the point is, we generally, people put those things after uh, the postnomials in order to like create confidence by the, the person who is like looking at them to be the provider. But if we're kind of skirting it or we're putting some lesser quality types of things on there, um, it's better to leave them off because it does more damage to our reputation than it does the enhancement of the reputation, which is the point of why we generally do those things. So um, anyway, just pay attention yep. is the point. It's, yeah, absolutely. Be productive. Which and this is a good one again. Yeah. This is a good example again of the complaint that I was talking about earlier where someone uses the term neurotherapist. Um, in many states, there would be people who were not allowed to use that term. Um, in general, it would imply that you're probably a medical person working in the world of neurology and therefore you're a neurotherapist. So if you're doing neurofeedback, just say that you're, 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 cert you're board certified in neurofeedback or I do neurofeedback or e.g. biofeedback. Those are the more common names. You'll see people in the field talk about being neurotherapists. Just be careful. Make sure that from the standpoint of your state, your licensing, your credentials, your scope of practice, that you can call yourself that because it, it, it has a strong implication of neurology. Um, <clears throat> BCIA is seeing more people using these terms that like B, BCB or BCN. Um, uh, board certified biofeedback candidate is what was in the previous slide or board certified neurofeedback candidate. Um, 
But if you're BCA, you are BCIA. You're not BCB or BCN. You're BCIA. And then those those are the divisions of where you can be certified. So be careful how you use your initials, like Leslie was saying. They're important to have out there when you're, people are questioning your credentials. And, you know, for folks uh, that go through all these trainings and they're certified in EMDR and QEEG and biofeedback and neurofeedback, that's all lovely. Just make sure that you can support that you have that credential <laughs> and that yeah. title. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, worth noting that most of those things are trademarked, and although it's um, a pretty um, low penalty, so to speak, of using those kinds of things, if you're not, there are some legal implications. So it's just not worth the hassle. So if you got it, great. If you don't, get it or don't put it. Period. The end. But be straightforward about it. That's the that's the point, particularly yep. as it relates to uh, marketing and advertising as well as billing. Those are the areas where most people um, get into trouble, which is kind of moving on to this this point of advertising. It's it's really challenging. Mental health, well, healthcare in general, but particularly, I think, in my opinion, mental health as, and advertising don't go well together. Um, having worked for a startup before, where the whole point of the marketing team was to make the product and the service sound as impressive as possible and to make it sound as applicable as possible to as many people as possible. There was a lot of contention between, um, not personal contention, but professional contention between marketing and the provider. And so if you, it's very common, we're not experts generally speaking in marketing, it's very common to hire a professional to help us with our marketing and advertising. Just be very comfortable in what you're allowing that individual or that group to put into your publications, your websites, and those kinds of things. And be very aware. Don't simply say, yeah, 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 you go do your thing and I'm going to do my thing and I'm going to be here in clinical practice working while they're doing your marketing without your oversight. Because their job is to get as many people in your door and you know emailing and calling you as possible. And so those claims, the types of language that is used may get fluffed up a bit more than you might be really comfortable with or should be um, operating within. So the point of that is just like saying, I get it. These two things don't go well together. The whole point of marketing is to embellish and create a big, as big of a sensation um, and opportunity as possible. And that's great. Is, but we want to make sure that we're overseeing that and making sure that we, we are comfortable with what's being put out there. Yeah, this particular slide here, this is a, a you know very well-known person in our field, but because he had the word neurofeedback in his website and the name of his practice, the board, uh, the state of New York uh, took action against him. And as you can see here, he's, he's filed complaints twice, he's been denied twice, he's been given very little explanation as to why. The State Department of Education that regulates professional corporations. And there it is. See, it's not the licensing board, it's the New York State Department of Education who's saying you can't use that. It implies the practice of medicine. Mm -hmm. And 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 no one's no one here has ever said that neurofeedback is a medical domain. <laughs> it's not. Okay. But that's how their board saw it. So you have to really be careful within your state because each state's a little different. Yeah, when in doubt, again, you can check with people or, or you know, in situations like this, uh, certainly this individual has been operating in this way for a period of time. And then, uh, you know, without knowing, they they set their practice up, they called it what they called it, everything was fine, but then later there was an issue. Mm -hmm. you know, when in doubt, in order to not cause yourself problems down the road, be as accurate to what your license allows you to say rather than the any particular modality, whether it's neurofeedback or EMDR or fill in the blank modality, mm -hmm. if you are closer to what your state calls it, your license as a counselor, call it counseling services of New York, that's going to be far more safe for you and have you create a, a longer uh, opportunity rather than having something as rules change, and et cetera, having to change your business and all of that effort and marketing and branding and all those things having to be redone. All right. Okay, okay. so hey. ethical dilemmas, like this is a whole a whole talk. Um, that's, a, that's another <laughs> moment in time. But the, the point here around the, the concept here is that 
sometimes we are about doing the lesser harm instead of the do no harm. And so what we want to be able to do is obviously be aware of ethical dilemmas and how to work through those. Um, you can see some of the talks that Rob and I've done in other venues and find those videos or check us out at ISNR this year again. Uh, but the point is that ethical dilemmas are messy, obviously, that's why they're called a dilemma and trying to work our way through that can be very challenging. So getting consults, asking your colleagues and then working through that in a formalized way is really helpful. But it's, it's one that happens a lot, particularly with regard to scope of practice. Yeah, I have nothing else I have to say to that. That's, okay. that's good. Yeah. Okay. Well, then take off. Defensive health All right. So you. defensive health care. Yeah. <laughs> it's not an ethical dilemma. Um, but it gives rise to court cases that call into question the necessity of a doctor's actions. So again, we have to be just, uh, you're hearing us say this over and over again, wording, how you advertise, what you describe, what you're doing. These are the things that can get us into trouble. And as you've seen now with a couple of examples, it'll, it may vary from state to state. I would have never guessed that um, the term neurofeedback would be a problem in New York because the Board of Education governs that. I would have never put those two together from a healthcare standpoint. But every state is different, and every state has, uh, even within licensing boards, there may be things in some states you can't do A, B, C, D, and E, and other states you can, even though you've got the same license. So I'll use myself as an example, LPC and now L, uh, licensed clinical mental health counselor. What I can do in my state may be very different than if I were to go and, and move to a different state and, and apply for licensure there. Um, because states have, when you apply for licensure, there's different requirements. When I first got my license, I was in the state of Oregon. I was one of the first counselors. My, my license number there was in the low hundreds. I was one of the first counselors to apply for licensure as a mental health counselor or licensed clinical or professional counselor in, in the state of Oregon. Then I moved to Vermont and I wasn't doing clinical work and I wasn't so terribly worried about it. But I maintained that license thinking I may go back to Oregon someday, but it wouldn't do me any good in another state. And then I moved to South Carolina and went to apply for a license there. And, it, and to get my license there, my degree and um, my education was such, I didn't have a course that that state requires. So I had to go take another course to get my licensure there, even though I was previously licensed. So the point we want to emphasize is always check with your state. Just because somebody else in a different state does A, B, C, D, and E doesn't mean that it's going to work well for you. And that's where I get into concerns about people giving advice. There was, a, a, again, there was a, on our listserv, on New Mind listserv, I think it was yesterday, there was a question about treating seizures and the person responding was a psychologist who may have very great expertise and training. But that person may be giving advice from his licensure and his perspective and his state and guidance and guidelines, and it may not be very applicable to the person who was asking the question in a different state. Yeah, it's messy. <clears throat> so ask yourself the question of like, it's not the question of, can I say this and it be accurate? It's if I say this, what are the possible implications? Again, that's right. the idea of this de defensive versus offensive. It's not, we're not on the marketing team. We're not saying how big of a claim can we make and it still be accurate? We're saying how, small of a claim can I make and not get into get into situations. All right. Good point. Yeah. <laughs> accepting All gifts. Right. So yeah, just generally speaking, um, in accepting gifts, and this is a little off the scope and a little bit more into just like ethical types of things that tend to happen for us. You know, generally speaking, gifts, if it's a token of appreciation, those kinds of things, it is appropriate and potentially more beneficial for us and the therapeutic relationship to accept those tokens of appreciation as someone's finishing treatment or you know maybe they brought a coffee or a gift card or something as long as it's a small and it's a it's a type of token if it's something that is um bigger or challenging or like when i say challenging i mean like um you know it's it's, it's money it's actual monies that are being exchanged then that's a, it makes it more complicated so 
we can politely decline those types of things because basically there's a couple of things. People often think that that's kind of like a, a more of a bartering type of situation. There's a quid pro quo there, but also um, the, the notion is that somehow the client may get the perception that they are being treated better or different by providing or by you accepting a gift. And so generally speaking, accepting gifts is frowned upon unless it's at the moment in which they are terminating uh, intervention or if it's around a particular holiday and they want to provide a Christmas card or a, a holiday type of thing, yeah. then that again is, you know, kind of negligible. Yeah. There was one gift I accepted. Uh, <laughs> it was from a, one of the kids I worked with and she made a little stuffed animal. It was like a mm -hmm. little white stuffed, it wasn't a bear, but like a little stuffed bear, but you know, it was like hand sized thing, very small. And, and the child gave that to me. It wasn't even the parent. It's like, I made this for you, Mr. Raw, because he helped me so much. So I accepted that. That would have been real problematic to not accept it from the kid, but right. that's not the type of gift that would be typically a problem for somebody. But there's the other ones that uh, Leslie mentioned, you gotta be really careful with. It's yeah. probably not in your best interest to accept them. <laughs> Yeah, and the way to avoid this kind of a situation is have it in your informed consent. Just let people know up front that I'm not allowed to accept gifts, although they're, you know, these kinds of things are nice gestures. It's just not something we do. It's just like I don't follow or be followed on social media with clients. The same kind of thing. Just put it out there in the yeah. beginning. These are things that are not allowed, and therefore it doesn't create any contention between you and the client that you're not accepting their gift or whatever. But then, as Rob mentioned, you know, there are some scenarios where not a big deal we just accept and, and move on yeah okay, okay. taking you're credit okay. for others work yes if you're working with uh, a client or a patient who is simultaneously working with one or more healthcare providers don't take all the credit for the client patient's improvement. Say, you know, it's, uh, you're working with, let's use Leslie and I as an example. I'm, I'm counseling somebody. We're, we're in the same office or in the same city or in the same state, and I'm counseling somebody who's got a lot of anxiety. And I say, you know, I have this colleague, um, uh, Leslie, and he's, he's, he's really good at, at doing this thing called neurofeedback, and it's been very beneficial to a lot of people who have had anxiety and sleep disorders. So I think you should go chat with him. So the person goes and Leslie does a consult. Person says, okay, let's get going and starts doing well and then really begins to have a whole lot of improvement. Um, well, at the same time, I'm counseling that person. So if Leslie says, yeah, well, thank God you came to me because I made the difference. <laughs> that would be somewhat problematic. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and this is also an easy way to uh, help people understand, like, the expectations around neurofeedback or any other intervention for that matter. You know, they're, they're maybe doing medication management. They might be doing, you know, their other therapeutic types of things. Just like, you know, is neurofeedback going to be helpful? People ask me all the time. I'm like, it's part of the solution. It may not be the silver bullet, but it is definitely helpful and part of a comprehensive solution. That way, not only are we setting ourselves up that we're not overtaking the credit for things, but also we're not taking the responsibility when things don't go according uh, to what we expect or hope for. So yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's all part of a, a bigger picture, right? Yeah, uh, Leslie here, uh, um, we do these, you know, lunch and learns and neuro at nights every week. And so we get into discussions oftentimes. And a good example of this would be someone who's working with a trauma patient. Uh, because most of us would say, if you're going to work with somebody using neurofeedback to work with trauma, they really need to be working with someone doing trauma therapy as well. The mm -hmm. neurofeedback mm -hmm. alone isn't going to be enough. And that's, that's a joint collaborative effort. And that's sort of what we're talking about here. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, absolutely, <laughs> exclamation point, um, yeah. Um, and then with profitability, offering clients a worse or lesser grade product for your own profit, don't do it. <laughs> yeah, Look at your, your, do, you have a, do you have an example or something in mind that kind of illustrates that of what, I know this came, was, came up from a, another thing, I don't know if there was if a I, specific I, example. If I were gonna, Put one together really quickly for it be let's say using something like um uh uh, uh I'm not saying that these are bad devices a muse or a mind lift they have um certain benefits and capabilities but they can't provide the same type of neurofeedback that a, a clinician with a good am can do there's there's okay. some things that can do some things that can do so if you decided that you know um 
well, if I don't know if you're 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 somebody I want to spend time with, here, I'll give you the mind lift to use versus having you come into the office. That would be sort of an example of of giving them a lesser sort of uh, product uh, versus um, and by charging them the same price. You know, mm. uh, we want okay. to send you home with this device, but I'm going to review your sessions. If you come into the office, you're going to I'd be charging you a hundred bucks for a session. So if you go home and do this, I'm going to charge a hundred bucks a session to review it. Something like that, yep. and it's it's not going to okay. be the same quality. If that if that fits, okay, yeah, absolutely, yeah. I was just imagining like a situation where um, it's we might diminish the type of quality of intervention, the time, or something like that in order to fit into a budget or something like this. But yeah, that's definitely um, you know something we have to oftentimes work, and this becomes really challenging. Sometimes I think it's much easier for us just to. Um, you know, obviously we're we're in a business where we are trying to like earn a living, so we can't do this all the times. But rather, when we want to make it work for people, sometimes the easiest solution from a financial perspective is to take a bit of a loss rather than negotiating a complicated fee structure or reducing a fee. But I'm going to reduce the amount of time you get. All those kinds of things can be seen mm. as um, just lesser quality, and therefore cause us particular problems down the road where a client doesn't get an outcome despite having invested significant monies with us or effort into the now i'll give another sort of example process. that um i might fit into this somewhere. category so um, if they can't afford a full session as an example it's instead of saying my, my rate is 100 bucks then i will do half an hour because you can afford half an hour just eat the <laughs> yeah make it make it work for them however that whatever that means you know like give them the hour and just charge something that's comparable and if they can't afford it then you know look for other ways or other providers or other types of services that might supplement yeah and here's another sort of example it, it's, it doesn't fit the profitability in the sense of the example here but it's it, it deals with making money um and that would be uh when somebody I've, in the in the new mind software if you don't plug in your amp it'll go into a simulation okay so if somebody wasn't paying attention to that um and it usually flashes up on the screen but if they if they you know click that off and forgot to plug the amp and i've had mentees who have run a session i'm gonna say well this session looks a little bit different than the other ones and i'll say you didn't plug your amp in that is a simulation pattern i've seen it a million times uh well what do i do i said well you know, honestly, you could just tell the, the, the client that, you know, um, there was an error with your equipment and so you're not billing them for that session. It was a, the, the equipment had a problem and you can them to be totally like, yeah, I forgot to plug it in. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, giving that person a, a break and not charging for that session, if the session was problematic, if there was, you know, you didn't have it plugged in, there really wasn't the session that occurred or something happens during the session where your equipment goes into 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 failure the electrode gets bad you can't finish up the session something like that so those are other things that would be i think comparable in this topic absolutely okay okay All so right. we've got a couple of interactions we've got some client clinician interactions to kind of review and then also i know that you'd like to save some time for questions so maybe we yeah. talk um you can walk us through this um interaction and then open it up or whatever you want we've got like four of these yeah. uh, five of these client interactions this 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 is just um something that came up from uh uh listserv i think um and it's it, you have, i think what we could do leslie because we're of time and questions is we can let them go look at these interactions okay. and read them um yeah, you know uh versus trying to go over this in some great detail but this is what this is this is an actual sort of dialogue that uh, someone posted and um and i went over and, and pulled out and uh okay um and then people talk about side effects and all that so yeah let's let's move on to the to uh, the next few slides so we have some time for q a no this is this is kind of the end i mean these are basically several of these interactions and that's that's all there is left on as far as the, the slide content so we can yeah. we can talk about some of these if you like um there's one that i thought was particularly interesting uh, because there's been a lot of conversation around side effects and these types of things lately. Um, I believe it's this one. Um, but how we talk about, um, let's see, let me, sorry, I'm kind of reading it as we go here. You know, a lot of these are aimed at just the dialogue that is happening between the professional 
and the, the client. And uh, both the one that I just had on the slide on the screen, as well as this one, there's, um, we want to be careful how we position ourselves in the, uh, around our colleagues in the profession. And there's going to be some colleagues who are, you know, they started yesterday and, you know, they just finished and they're, they're whatever training, hopefully, and they're just started getting started. And then there's going to be people who certainly have years and years of experience. And so we want to make sure that we kind of position ourselves or help frame the context of whatever that client is, is saying. And if you've been in, you know, had more than a few clients, there's been one who has seen a previous provider, whether it's neurofeedback or other types of counseling services or whatever. And they'll say, well, but the reason why I'm here is because the other provider, X, Y, Z, whatever it is. Um, and then we just simply want to say, yeah, you know, there's different styles to doing things, or maybe there was, you know, some thinking behind that rather than tossing our colleague under the bus. That that kind of word travels quickly and can cause some significant challenges. Um, but anyway, uh, this one was in particular one that I thought was um, kind of a, a place to end is the, the, the takeaway from here is that the, the thing that was happening here was the clinician, the initial clinician was not able to describe or talk about what the treatment plan was and why they were implementing a particular protocol. And that, that's really what we want to be able at any moment to be able to explain and justify why we're doing what we're doing. And that's why these types of opportunities of education are so critical is because we don't want to do it just because that's where the red spot was or just because that's what happened in the why yeah, thoughts, this is, being able to justify from a clinical context why we're doing what we're doing. Go ahead. Yeah, I, and I put this one in here too because I, I know I know this situation and you know patients mm -hmm. deserve and clients deserve to have a straightforward answer. If we mess up, you should say, you know, I made a mistake here. But you know, um, but to to lie and say, for example, that grogginess is a part of these symptoms and it's going to go on for days and days and days. No, usually, if you're running a neurofeedback session and the person has a side effect from the neurofeedback session, more often than not, those side effects don't last for days and days and days. They may have a headache, be a bit irritable, or feel a bit tired, and they may go on for an hour or so, or maybe, you know, a few hours, but it's not going to go on for days and days and days, typically. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Very good. Well, with that, let us uh, wrap up. Go into Q&A. Yeah. 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 All right, we'll get everybody. I think everybody's uh, going to either be muted or unmuted, and if not, we'll wait. To give it a minute to do have that done. We're unmuting people. Okay. We got half of them unmuted. Lots of them are unmuted. All right. Well, we can start from uh, up, up top. Anybody uh, have any questions, comments? Uh, can you tell me about uh, <clears throat> billing for my technician? <clears throat> if I, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, end of COVID. <laughs> Is your technician um, an independently licensed provider or are they supervised by you? You know, that's a great question. And I I, um, I posted that on the listserv uh, for New Mind and I can go back and repost it because I actually wrote to um, Judy Crawford about it because it came up in a previous discussion. So the, the long and the short answer is, if you are BCIA certified, then to follow BCIA guidelines, if you have a technician that's BCIA certified, then they should be working under your direct supervision with you in the office. They shouldn't be like working in your, your practice, the second office across town, and you're in the practice at, at the other location. But as Judy said, BCIA, is, it's, it's a voluntary certification process. They don't govern whether technicians have to be board certified or not, or clinicians have to be board certified or not. It's a certification process that's voluntary. But when you go get certified with BCIA, 
then the expectation is is you follow their guidelines as a, as a certified clinician and a certified technician. But in the absence of that, you can have people working under you as, um, as technicians. Um, our guidance would always be, from our perspective, uh, to use BCIA for certification of them, but if you're not board certified and they're not board certified, then just use common sense and logic like we've just described and be careful about what that technician is doing. A technician really should be somebody who runs a session. Uh, they can gather data for a map, but they are not there to interpret or go over the findings of the session and give the patient feedback. They're just running a session or, or running a queue. Well, my concern is more about uh, billing insurance as a psychologist uh, that uh, I would like them to handle the extra patients. And if I want to take some time off, that they can work alone to just simply run a session. Yeah, are they are they a licensed provider themselves or are they unlicensed? Unlicensed. Unlicensed. So it depends on a couple of things. So your state would dictate for sure, that's the place I would go first. But generally speaking, if they are, when you are away, it would probably not be billable to the insurance. Um, that would be trickier, um, but you can certainly get clarification from the state. If they allow a technician to work under your license legally, then you can bill as an extension, but it would be less likely that that would be the case if you're not on site. Um, personally, what I would probably suggest is that you're using that individual to, if you have any cash pay clients, using them for that, that's the safest thing to do. But if you're on site supervising and you will see the client whether that's at the beginning of the session or the end of the session. So for example, when I mentioned I was working for a physician doing sessions, he would come in at the beginning of the session. Hey, how's it going? What's going on? Yada, yada. Okay, great. I'll see you later. I would then carry out the session. In, in our state, for, his, for that insurance, they were required to make contact with the patient in order for it to be billable to the insurance company. So there's nuances and there's not a generic answer that we can get, but generally speaking, um, it would you would probably have to be on site and potentially even have to make contact with the client in order to be for that to be billable to the insurance. Thank you, Leslie. Yeah, absolutely. Your state license and the and then the insurance company. I mean, so, you know, sometimes we get into this place of like we don't want to ask questions because we don't want to know. But if we really want to know, I have found and others who have reported back to me have found that the insurance well, insurance is a different thing, but that their state licensing boards at least are receptive to helping us get educated and do things in the way that's um, most appropriate. So you may not be setting yourself. We, we get this assumptions like with the FDA and all these other things. We're like, don't ask. We don't want them to look at us. Well, it's probably better to ask and <laughs> know yeah. than it is to, to make an assumption and then get in trouble. Later. All right. Any other last quick questions? As I know we're at the top of the hour here. Well, okay. If not, uh, Leslie, thanks again so much for uh, joining us today and working with me to do this uh, Thank you. talk and uh, appreciate everybody attending and thanks everybody. This should be posted um, uh, probably within a couple of days on the Newmont YouTube channel. And once it is posted, uh, we'll let you know. So until then, take care everybody. See you Friday, See but you're you here Friday. at Lunch and Learn. And Leslie, thanks again. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank All you right, so much. Bye, everybody.